Mrs. Brown. Okay. Mom's got to start that. Um, Stella was working. David was toddler. Still in diapers, but he could walk. And um, she took David over to this lady's house to babysit every day. And she also took a can of vegetable soup for his lunch. And every day she'd pick him up and he'd be all uh, dressed and ready to go and cleaned up. And But she'd take him home and he'd just be starving. So while she was fixing dinner, she'd set him up there on a chair and she'd scramble him an egg to eat. Well, it turned out that he became allergic to eggs for a while because the lady was feeding the soup to her husband and giving David eggs for lunch. And he was getting too many eggs for somebody that size. I got hives. Yeah. But anyway, one of the neighbors pulled mom aside one day and said, come over a little bit earlier than you usually do. And she did, and she found David wearing the same diaper that she'd left him in in the morning, just dragging around. And uh, somebody, I don't know if it was that same neighbor or somebody else, said, well, why don't you get yourself a colored girl? Because they'll come in, and not only will they watch the children, but they'll do your ironing and clean your house for you. So I don't know how she actually found Mrs. Brown, but that's how they got Mrs. Brown. And David... Now, Mrs. Brown was fresh from Arkansas. A southern state. Very much southern. And so when Mom was talking to her the first day, she says, well, sit down here and we'll have a cup of coffee. Oh, no, Mrs. Child. That's, I, can't, I can't do that. Why not? Oh, no, Mrs. Child. <laughs> Color folk don't. Sit down with white folk, you know? She says, in my house, you do. In my house, you're not a color. You're part of the family. And uh, throughout the years that Mrs. Brown took care of me and then took care of Susan, she was really part of the family. She was, uh, she loved our, every one of us kids, and we loved her. One day she had Susan was cleaning her face at the mirror in the bathroom. Oh, no, that was candy. Oh, was that candy? Oh, okay. Candy was like about four years old. So you you had Mrs. were with Mrs. Brown for a long time. Then. A long time, yeah. And Candy looked in the mirror, said, "Mrs. Brown, you gotta wash your face. <laughs> it's all dirty." Uh, but. Uh, when Mrs. Brown passed away, she was attending at that time a church down in North Richmond. And uh, my folks were out of the country, so me and uh, Maxine and Linda went to the funeral. Huh. Really? Were you there too? Yeah. We were married. Uh, anyway, we, we came in early and sat down towards the front. And in a little while, this usher comes up and says, uh, excuse me, uh, are you family? <laughs> the front seats are reserved for family. Oh, okay. So we moved. Uh, I should have said, yeah, but I don't think he would have understood. So during the funeral, we're the only white faces in the whole place. And we're, people are looking at us, wondering why we're there. And, that. and then they opened it up for people to... Uh, had their remembrances of Onita Brown, and my sisters are elbowing me to get, go on, go on, get up there. So finally I went up there, and I told them a little bit about our relationship to Mrs. Brown and how she was very much a part of our family, and how we cherished her in so many ways. But uh, it was an interesting funeral, to say the least. But... Uh, she always appreciated my mother for, for uh, sitting down as an equal with her. But every day Mrs. Brown would come to take care of her kids and clean her home. She'd drive up in this Cadillac and get out dressed like she was a 
princess or something, just really to the nines. It was real interesting. And uh, mom, of course, was working, so she had work clothes on when I she was working at a factory or something. Or she used to wash and starch her jeans, press them, just so. Who did? She, your, Mrs. Brown would wash her mother's blue jeans as she wore to work. And they were all pressed and crisp and everything. Even our sheets were starched and ironed. But uh, anyway, that's where Mrs. Brown came in. Now, we were talking, I think, about Susan with leukemia and such a hard time for the family. Uh, especially for my mother. What your heart was for? Motivation. Oh. And, uh, I never used motivation like that. I never used something bigger. The day... Your Lego artist. Susan, finally, she was down south, in uh, Southern California, at Linda's house, and, uh, she got sick, and they had to rush her back up here to the hospital. And she just got worse and worse, and, uh, Linda had her own house when... Yeah, Linda was married in, down in Southern California at that time. Well, then she was visiting Linda. Right, I said that. Oh, okay. So, Susie's in the hospital and everyone's upset and she's getting worse. And uh, uh, for a while before she went to the hospital, she, she was at home in bed, and was, we were caring for her there. But when she got sicker and sicker, now she's 10 years old, and uh, she's in the hospital. She died the same day that I got my mission call to New Zealand. It was a strange day with mixing the highs and the lows. And, uh, but it, uh, so we'll always remember Susie. And uh, I swear at one time when I was at one of my lows, uh, running the business and everything, I was coming home. And I don't know why, but I could, I could feel Susan's presence. And it had a calming effect for me. I felt like things were going to be okay. And uh, I, I, I didn't hear a voice that I can recall, but I knew it was her, and uh, I felt, you know, that she cared. So, uh, anyway, then I was uh, off on my mission, and uh, goodbye Ezra. Bye. Bye, Dad. Okay. Bye, Grandma. You can watch Bye. this later, Ezra. Over for a sleepover sometime. Yeah. I just about wanna, ten years from now, we'll be fine. You were talking about feeling your presence, like when you were driving your truck recently. No, I was, I was, I was running eight ball, and I was coming home in my vehicle, my car, or whatever I had. Very, you know, upset about how things were going. Worry. Right. I don't. I, I just want to make because because you were ju jumping back to right when you're going on your mission. So I just no. want to. Oh, that, this was years later, you know, when I was running the company and everything. Right. But I felt that. Now, okay. mom. Not long after, Susie, had, after dad had passed away. <laughs> I know this story. Mom says. She that was sitting she, on the couch. she was sitting on the couch, and she saw Dad. And with Dad was a beautiful woman, about 30 maybe. 
and she didn't know who that was at first. And she was a little irritated right at first, too, that he would show up with this good-looking woman on his arm. It turns out <laughs> that was Susie. And uh, so it, it begs the question of, of what we are like after we pass away. What form do we take? Uh, whether we die in childhood or, or 90 years old, I think we revert back to the prime of hey, our Dad. life. Yeah. David, pardon me. Because that certainly was the case David, with me, Susan, who died at 10. Mm. Wait, Matthew, come and, with uh, us? Yeah. Oh, so Dad. at that time, uh -huh. yeah. I. Uh, started getting ready for my mission. We got this call. When I was interviewed for my mission, the bishop asked me, where do you want to go? There must have been a f place on the forum to put that down. And I said, I want to go as far away from home as I can and still speak English. And they must have got that in the committee for missionaries and laughed and looked on the map. Where would that be? Because they didn't send me just to New Zealand. They sent me to the New Zealand South Mission. Since there wasn't a South African mission at that time, that was as far away as you could go and still speak English. It was farther south than Australia. So, I, I got ready and uh, got all the shots and, and folks gave me a new suitcase and uh, packed everything we could in there, and, and I, uh, I got a ride with some uh, rich kid in uh, Walnut Creek back to BYU, and uh, that was a story in and of itself. Mom takes me over there at the appointed time early in the morning after we get there. Then the mother wakes up her son because we're there finally on the time they said. Mom was so irritated. <laughs> anyway, uh, I spent a, a night at BYU visiting with friends, staying at uh, Helaman Halls with one of them, I think it was. And uh, then I took a bus into Salt Lake. I didn't know what I was supposed to do, where I was supposed to go. I got off the bus, I got this suitcase, all this stuff, I could barely move carrying it and uh, had to ask people, well, where's the mission home, where do I go? And they pointed across Temple Square to the other side where the conference center is now. There was an old yellow brick building there, and that was the mission home. That's where you went. And uh, Salt later, Lake, not in Provo. In Salt Lake, no. Then they tore that down, and they built the Deseret Gym. Then they tore that down and built the conference center. So this was before the Deseret Gym. Uh, no, they had a MTC in Provo for those with foreign language. So, I struggled up there and they found my name and gave me a room and I moved in and followed all the other penguins in black and white, <laughs> trudging up and down wherever they sent us, you know. And I had some interesting times while I was there. I. I had never planned on going on a mission. It was the last thing in the world I was ever going to do. And uh, then my first year at the Y, things kind of turned and changed. I got my patriarchal blessing, and I followed the Spirit and applied for my mission. But was that also part way to uh, stay out of Vietnam? Or? No, no, not that really not then. That hadn't started yet. Well, it started. But well, I mean, that the didn't have any impact. I was in school, you know. But no, not going to Vietnam didn't tell me to go on my mission. It was purely a spiritual decision. And uh, but prior to that, I had not prepared myself at all. I never really went to seminary except to pick up my girlfriend. I. Uh, I was the class clown in Sunday school class and things like that. I, I didn't know squat. So, in the 
mission home for a week or two, they uh, they have different speakers come in, and uh, they they teach us different things. And one of the speakers was telling us about succession uh, in the church. Who would be the next prophet, sort of thing? The president of the quorum. Of the and Twelve David O. McKay was the prophet. At this yeah, time. David O. McKay was the prophet at that time. And uh, so I had a question. I, I rose my hand. I was about three rows back. And the apostle there said yes. I said, what if the uh, Lord doesn't want that man to be the prophet? That's the president of the Quorum of the Twelve. And I didn't realize this was Joseph Fielding Smith, the next prophet of the church. <laughs> you could see his neck get red as went out his Things like that. The missionaries scattered. I was all alone. I, oh no, what did I do? He leaned over that pulpit. He stared at me. Then he wouldn't be there. He said, I said okay, I agree. I'm sorry. I, I was just plain ignorant. That's all. I didn't know. Uh, and uh, then we, uh, they took us to the temple because most of us came from areas where there wasn't a temple. There were only 13 in the world at that time, most of them in Utah. And uh, we went down to the march down to the Salt Lake Temple and went through two sessions. And uh, by the end of those two sessions, I know I was exhausted, I'm sure everybody else was too. And then they took us upstairs to the, uh, I think it's what it's called, the priesthood room or something. I'm, one side you had the Aaronic priesthood and seats up there, and this side you had the Melchizedek priesthood and seats up there. And we were sitting in the middle, and an apostle was up there to answer any questions we had about the temple. I must have had a lot of questions, but I fell asleep. I, what a time to fall asleep. But uh, I can remember that room. This magnificent room must be upstairs in the Salt Lake Temple somewhere. And, it was uh, in the temple? It was in the Salt Lake Temple. You know, if you go to the visitor center now, they've actually got this little model in one of the visitor centers. I saw that. With that thing open up, so you could probably point. Was it the big, so it was the big, like, auditorium room? Yeah, big room. One side had big letters, Aaronic Priesthood, and big letters on the other side. Yeah, you, you can Priesthood. see that in that model, that, that auditorium room. Anyway... So after our two weeks there of our indoctrination, uh, getting our temple garments, and they didn't tell us how to get into those things. They were one-piece garments. And all us missionaries go back up to our room and try to get into them. Some are pulling them over their head this way. Some trying to get in through the bottoms. They didn't know how. It was the funniest thing I remember seeing, you know, until we finally figured it out. Someone should have given us some instructions, I think. But I put on those single-piece garments and it felt so natural, it felt so good. I've never wanted to go to two-piece after that. I have a pair for when I go to the doctor, but otherwise, I just, uh, the nat most natural thing in the world for me is to have those one-piece garments. So, <laughs> at the end of the two weeks, everyone's being shipped out here, there, and they gave me my uh, plane ticket. And they said, it leaves in two weeks. I said, what? <laughs> what, do I, what do I do for two weeks? I don't know, they said. <laughs> you know, so I, here I am, a lone missionary, set apart. I'll tell you about that, too. <laughs> and what do I do? So I, I had an aunt there, and I called her up, and she came down and got me. And uh, I don't know how I had her name. Maybe I called home and got it or something. But, uh, and they just... Uh, She had a couple daughters, one close to my age, one a little younger, and uh, they just gave me the keys of the car and says, go touring while we're at work. I drive all around Salt Lake, see things. Uh, I don't think they'd allow that now. <laughs> You'd be your companion right then, you know. But uh, Is that when you get the picture of uh, Thomas S. Monson that we got among your mission slides? No. No, that was on the mission. That was on my mission. 
Oh, so that was at because it looked to me like that was a picture at Temple Square. That was in Gisborne. No, that was in Gisborne, New Zealand. Oh. Actually, we saw the we saw the the chapel. Before my mission, I had to be interviewed by a general authority because I'd been a naughty boy, and uh, the rules were a little bit different then than they are now, and so I had an appointment up at the Tri Stake Center. And I went in this big room, and they're just filled with people. They were dividing the steak. I didn't know that. And I, I'm sitting there, and, and this apostle, Thomas S. Monson, was new, uh, the newest apostle, I think, in the church at that time, 1964. And he was setting apart all these bishops and stuff, and stake presidencies and stuff. And it was like a machine, the way he went through them. And yet, for all his speed, when he laid his hands on someone's head, you could just tell what he said was for that person, about that person, a very personal blessing for what he was called to. And yet he went right to, right to, it was amazing. I was just, I was just awestruck. And then, of course, I was the least important in the whole place, so I was dead last. Everybody's gone, and he comes and gets me, and we sit in a room and, and talk a little bit, and I had a mustache I was growing just for fun, you know. While he, you were on your mission? No, I wasn't on my mission yet. I was oh. being interviewed for it. Oh, okay. And he says, well, you can wear that on your mission if you want. I said, oh, no, no, I'm just playing around. I'll cut it off, you know. Uh, later on, I, he came to our mission, and I saw him again. But uh, I, I, that was my my one brush with the future prophet of the church. Close encounter, you might say. Then I went on my mission to New Zealand. There were 13 of us that got on the plane to go, and they made me the... Uh, the captain. I was in charge of everyone, anyway. Uh, the traveling leader. Traveling leader or something. And uh, they, on this plane, they were feeding everybody little bottles of booze and that, so oh, no, no. some of the guys were watching me and when I turned my head they'd take them. I don't know what they did with them, but you know, just goofing around. But uh, then we got to New Zealand and got picked up by the mission president and I was in the car that had the mission president. There were several cars transporting us and that was the hairiest ride I've ever had. The uh, assistant to the president was driving, and he obeyed the right-hand rule law in New Zealand. You look to the right, if anyone's coming on your right, they had to stop. You had to stop for this guy, and he ignored that guy. Cars would be screaming down from the left. He'd look to the right and just gun through. The, the mission president was going, oh, ah, he hadn't been there very long either. He thought he was going to die. This guy just barreled on through. And uh, then they took us to the bank to exchange our money, because then they had pounds, shillings, and pence. And they were rattling off all this exchange to me. You know, I didn't know what they were saying. I had all this funny money. And it took a long time not to spend a pound note like a dollar, because a pound note then was worth five dollars. And it's, it's gone, you know. I spent it like it was a dollar. Didn't think anything of it until you ran out of money. But uh, I, then I had all my missionary experiences, which I don't know, maybe I'll cover another time. Man, we got, yeah, a, we got them all in. Yeah, we've got recordings of those anyway. Yeah. I was, yeah. Talk, then, a, talk about, uh, you know, your your high school high school days with, you know, Richard. And talk about some of those, some of those things. Well, I don't think Richard wants his children to ever hear about it. <laughs> Well, my buddy Richard and I went to different high schools. And well, is I mean, this, you guys were buddies during that time. And yeah, we grew up. Which Richard is this? Richard Cavan. Richard Cavan that lives down in, in Provo now. Right. In uh, Pleasant, Pleasant Grove. Grove. He, uh, whatever. We, we got together as uh, primary students and said, him, Dick Parsons, and me, we said, we're going to be buddies for life. And we were. Dick Parsons has kind of wandered somewhere else. Didn't you, I remember weren't you guys buddies with, uh, who was the other guy? He was in our ward in, uh, in Fairfield, fourth ward. Bald-headed guy. 
Oh, you mean, you don't mean uh, Jay, do you? Jay, Jay Barker. Uh, Barker. Barker, yeah. Well, Jay yeah, Barker was younger so I had, than us. I had their bed, their captain's bed or whatever that. Yeah, he was, he was a, a friend who grew up in the ward together, but he was younger, so I didn't pay a lot of attention to him. The only thing I, what I really remember about Jay was when we played softball, I I'd play first base and he was on second and he'd throw that ball in right at my crotch every time. Scared the daylights out of me. And, uh, but, uh, yeah, all of us played basketball, baseball, all those sports that we had in the church then. It was a lot of fun. You talk uh, about in your basketball game, just five of you. <laughs> well, our ward was kind of the black sheep of all the stake. We didn't, uh, we had a nice building and that was about it. We were always short-handed. We never, the only time we had a coach for our basketball team, church ball, was when they grabbed someone from another ward and had him be our coach. What did your ward cover? Just Was it just Richmond? Or? It was just Richmond. Then. So basically all of Richmond. Yeah. And uh, most of the time there was just five of us that would show up and play and we didn't have uniforms of course. No one gave us uniforms. My tennis shoes were so bad I had to duct, I had to, it wasn't duct tape, it was black tape. I'd tape them up before I played so they wouldn't fall off my feet. And uh, because I bought all my own clothes. <laughs> and some things I could afford, some I couldn't. But uh, we went down to the Tri-State Center for a big game, and there was this one ward. Uh, it was, uh, I can't think of the designation. But anyway, they were in Oakland, and they had, they always went back to all church. They had three squads on their team. They had equipment managers, they all had uniforms of course, and they had coaches, assistant coaches, and the whole shebang. And uh, we show up, five of us, in cutoffs and beat up tennis shoes, and we're supposed to play these guys, we didn't even have a substitute. And I was the tallest guy on our team at about 6'1", and the shortest man on their team was bigger than I was. So I'd get up there to jump ball with this big guy, you know. Uh, I actually got it a couple times. But we, we weren't expected, we didn't expect to win, so we were loose. We were, we were there to have fun. These guys were serious, but we were there to have fun. The first quarter of that game, we held them two points to four points. They had the four points, but that's all they had. And that coach, you can see him on the sideline running up and down screaming at him and all this do this do that we'd yell over hey coach put in the reserves you know <laughs> and make them matter you know teasing them and uh, it was it was pretty funny i mean we we, we really held them to nothing that first quarter they eventually got ahead and ahead and ahead and they beat us by 30 points but that didn't matter we, we didn't have any we were dead on our feet by the end of the game anyway we didn't have subs they had three squads so, but uh, it was one of my fondest memories of church basketball. But it was, we had some rough games, I'll tell you. We'd, uh, there'd be uh, blood on the court at times when we were playing. Parents on the sidelines would be uh, hollering at us and screaming at us and angry at us. and. I remember I got up to the foul line once and the parents were there screaming. I thought, I'll show them. I set the ball down on the foul line and walked away told, I can't play with them screaming like that. So the rest had to come over and call them down, made them in. <laughs> parents even matter, you know. It was, it was fun. We really enjoyed that. Uh, <laughs> but poor old Richmond Ward never had much of a, uh, an impressive ball team. I remember softball, one game we went out and we were, we were over in Oakland at a, at a big field. Uh, I don't think we had much in the way of facilities in Richmond, we always had to go somewhere else. We were playing this team, it was fastball then, it wasn't slow pitch, it was fast pitch softball. And, uh, and uh, he put, put me up, I was about fifth batter or something. That game, 
I got four home runs. I hit them so far, the field was endless. The guy just had to run, run, run for him, and I'd run all the way around. It was, they, they put me in cleanup after that. I don't think I ever did that good again. But, you know, one of those games, you, everything went right. It was just slick. But you have these memor memories. So my buddy Richard and I would always play in basketball. We had, uh, we were over by his house one night. These guys wanted us a little pickup game, uh, two on two or something. It was an outdoor court and it was getting dark. And uh, everything I threw up just went in. Just one of those things. If it had been daylight, I probably couldn't have hit it. But <laughs> they were over there whispering, Richard, where's that guy? Where's that guy? <laughs> You know, every, we all have our little glory days, but uh, Richard wasn't fat like he is now. He was a skinny kid, and he was a good shot, and, you know, ball handler, and everything. Had, had a lot of fun. I was, I was the man under the basket, taking the bruises. But uh, we played all the sports there. And they used to have the Aaronic Priesthood Day, and they would have all these field and track events. I don't see them doing that now. But we would have long jump, 40-yard uh, dash, and this, and a mile run, and all that. And uh, it was, you'd get ribbons, of course, and everything. It was. That was at that was school? Good. No, that was a church. Oh, wow. Aaronic Priesthood Commemoration had those things going on. Big events, you know, the whole state there. So I, had, I was big into sports all the time growing up. So, uh, I don't know what, what else you want to know when I came back off my mission. Well, I want to hear more about your youth. Yeah, I, I kind of liked hearing these stories like uh, about grandma and whatnot. Well, let's see. I mean, there's plenty of time to go after your mission, and we'll, we can do all that another day. I want to hear more about your youth. I remember, like, I never heard about Mrs. Brown until last time uh, Maxine and them were over. Yep, Mrs. Brown. She she loved me. She Be loved careful me. Careful, you got the dog's tail under you. I'm going to find it when I come back. <laughs> well, uh, uh, I remember when I was little and Ron had this uh, convertible. It must have been like a 36 Ford or something. Pretty cool car. And we were living up at Point Richmond, so we're up on a hill, and there's on the other side of the road was a big drop off and everything. And he had Shep, our German Shepherd, in the back seat there, and he went up to do something. I was outside. Shep jumped out, and when he jumped out, he kicked off the emergency brake or something. That car started to roll, you know. I remember jumping in there. Pushing the pedals, I didn't know which pedal to push, you know, and it wouldn't stop. Finally, I turned the wheels up and ran out to the curb. I don't think my brother even thanked me for that. I saved his car from going off over the cliff, you know. <laughs> Bits and pieces of my memory of my youth. Um, we used to hike in those hills in Point Richmond. There were big hills all the way around up there. And we would hike for miles. And in the summertime, when the weeds got real tall and dry, we'd get pieces of cardboard and get up on top of a hill and slide down, just like sledding on snow. You'd go like crazy down. Didn't stop till you hit something or ran out into the street, you know. And uh, we used to do that all the time. You kind of made your own fun, you know. Finally, one Christmas, I got a bicycle. And my neighbor next door was, compared to me, a rich kid. He had a brand new bicycle. My parents got an old 24-incher and put new tires on it, and I had, that's my first bicycle. And, uh, but, you know, I could get places with that. I, I must have gone all over with that thing. Uh, one Christmas, late mid years later, I got a brand new bicycle, a J.C. Higgins, with skinny tires and, 
and three years. It was pretty fancy. I remember that. But uh, we used to, like I say, go down to the corner uh, grocery store and uh, and butcher shop. And the the butcher was friends of our family, made friends. And, he would always give me bones for my dog that I'd bring back. And I came home one time with this beautiful bone for Shep. My Aunt Sade was there. And Aunt Sade said, give me that. I said, that's for Shep. He, she said, he can have it when I'm done with it. <laughs> she made soup for the whole family and gave me this bleached bone back <laughs> that Shep wasn't interested in. I never showed her any of my bones after that, you know. I remember once they gave me a whole rib cage, I don't know why, and I had all these dogs following me all the way home, <laughs> <laughs> hauling that, those bones off that rib cage. But, uh... Your Aunt Sadie was the same one with the pigeons? Yeah, same one with the pigeons. You want the pigeon story? Sure, appropriate right now. <laughs> when my mother was a little girl, uh, it was during the... Depression, the start of the Depression, I guess. And Aunt Sade lived with them in San Francisco. And she took my mom and went down to the park and bought a bag of popcorn for a nickel. That was unheard of. A nickel. You could drive, you could take the trolley all the way across San Francisco for a nickel. You could go to a movie for a nickel. You could do all kinds of things. She bought this bag of popcorn. And Mom thought it was for her, and Aunt Say says, well, when I'm done, you can have what's left. So, they went to the park, they sat on the bench, and Aunt Say started feeding popcorn just to the pigeons. Now, Aunt Say was a pioneer lady. She was on the last wagon train, one of the last wagon trains to come to Utah, uh, before the trains did, came through. And uh, she... Uh, would feed these pigeons, they'd get closer and closer, then she'd reach out, grab one, wring its neck, and stick it in her purse. Keep feeding the pigeons, they'd come closer, she'd grab another one, wring its neck, stick it in her purse, till her purse was full of pigeons. Then she gave what was left of the popcorn to my mother. They went home and she made pigeon stew <laughs> out of that. And she said it was the greasiest stew she'd ever had. Those pigeons were so fat. I think it's like eating feathered rat myself. But. San Francisco pigeons? Yep. No, they pretty much are rats, from what I understand. But it was food. I probably made a delicious meal for everybody. And say could make food out of, I mean, meals out of anything, I think. But uh, where was I before I had say? Oh, that was the, you were, that you were talking about the shot and the bones. The yeah, butcher. You had a rib cage and the dogs were following you home. Yeah. Unless you have more of that. Well. Uh, I don't remember too much about Aunt Sade, except she was there, and, and Grandma Rain, that was her sister, was was also prim and proper, and Aunt Sade was a help you know. Uh, she had her own ideas of what was a, what made a successful marriage. She had three husbands and had the fourth one picked out, and before she died. And she gave my mom this marital advice when they got, when she was getting married. She says, keep your man happy. You got to keep his belly full and his prick empty. <laughs> that was her advice. Uh, I mean, I guess that works. <laughs> and uh, as a kid growing up, it was, it was fun living up there in the, the hills. On the far most, the highest hill they had, an air raid siren. Remember, this was Cold War times. And they would set that thing off for a test area so often. Blare loud, you could hear it two cities over. You know, it would just hurt your ears. And uh, it was always kind of scary when they'd set it off. And, and in school, they would teach it to duck and cover under the desks in case there was an atom bomb blast. You wouldn't get cut by the glass. 
everybody always mocks that, you know, calling it stupid, but it actually makes a lot of sense. Oh, yeah. I mean, if you're in the blast zone, it doesn't matter. But if, if you're outside just catching the, the part of the blast that's knocking the windows out, you don't want to be all cut by that glass. That you're safe under your desk. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it made sense. But uh, uh, I can remember those days, and it was so, so scary thinking we were going to get a nuclear bomb on us. Uh, my high school days, I never liked high school much. I was too young. Back in grade school, when I started grade school, I was uh, first or second grade, I think, they used to have high second, low second, high first, low first grade, you know. They had a, then they combined them in just one grade. And they looked at me and I was a big kid, so they moved me into the next grade up instead of I should have stayed with my age group. Now I was with kids a year older than me. And that went that way all through school. So I, was, I felt I was always at a disadvantage. Played football in high school. I was 16 playing with 18-year-olds, you know, I was a severe disadvantage there. And uh, I was 17 when I graduated. So I uh, just turned 17 when I graduated. I was a senior at 16. So uh, if, if I could have been put back instead of up, I think I would have done real well in football because I, you know, I never got cut. I was on the team. Uh, until my last year, I was always first string. Then we got this stupid coach for our varsity coach. He knew there. And the, I, was, I was playing center. I was always first string on, on sophomore and junior varsity. Now I was on varsity. And the guy ahead of me, Gary Kaiser, was an All-American center. And, of course, he was first string. So, what am I going to do? I did, first game, they had me sitting on the bench the whole game. I was so humiliated, I quit. I said, I'm not going to do this. If I'd had some advice, but this was the time when Dad and Mom were so focused on Susan that as long as I didn't get into trouble, they didn't bother. And uh, I could have used the advice to have talked to the coach and asked him, look at put me on defense and I'll be your backup center in case Kaiser blows his knee or something. But let me play and I'll be there because he was real angry when I quit. But he was dumb as dirt, that coach. My friend Ray Gilbert was trying out for the team. He was a long ball center and this coach is teaching us something out there and he's got uh, uh, Ray on the ball, the center, when he was ready. And he, he's looking between his legs, and the coach is talking to us, and he gestures like this. And he centers the ball, and the coach goes, oh, whap, right in the face. And he, he blistered poor Ray. It wasn't Ray's fault, it was his fault, you know? He went like that, that's the signal to center it. And he got a good one, right in his face, you know? <laughs> I can remember in JV's, I love playing football. I got, in one game, I got the first five tackles of the game by myself. They tried running through where I was, and I got the first five tackles. And also in that game, I penetrated, I was a lineman, I penetrated the line, and they were running a sweep. And I had practiced to be fast for 10 yards. I figured that's what I needed on the line. I had to be fast for 10 yards. I couldn't keep up with these guys for any distance, but for 10 yards, I could turn and I could keep up with anybody. And I remember on this one sweep, I got behind and I chased that guy. And I, that was when horse collaring was legal. I horse collared him before he could turn up field. He was a real quick halfback, and I got him. Because 10 yards, I, another couple yards, he would have been gone, but I got him. And we crashed like that into the side. And one of the, I was so proud, and one of the guys said he was standing next to, next to this coach, and he said, who did that? Who got him? Well, she, you know, don't get credit. <laughs> there was another time when 
for some reason, I was running, blocking for a running back going to the end zone. There was two tacklers there. And I took them both out with one tackle, and the guy made it in there. And the coach still didn't know who did it. So, you know, <laughs> I loved football. I enjoyed it immensely. And uh, it was very disappointing to, to quit in my senior year. I wish I'd had a little advice. It would have been nice. My dad came to one of my games all the time I played, came to one game. But he was working all the time. He was putting 100 hour weeks in, you know. My uh, brother-in-law, uh, Carl Humphrey, came and actually took a, uh, some movie cameras of our games, and we got them somewhere, and you can see me in there playing football, number 66. I don't know where that is, but we got to try to find it. Bottom basement somewhere. Yeah. It's not here. I've gone through every, every family photo uh, movie film we had and I got it all put on uh, uh, we went to a fancy place in Washington had mom there and my two sisters and brother and I and this guy would put up the different because we had regular eight super eight and everything you know and he would run them on the screen and we'd come and give a commentary on it. we tried to put them in some sort of chronological order and uh, with mom's commentary and the rest of us. And, and we have that, we have that disc. But I don't know where that film is of me playing football. I'd like to find it. Tell us about your junior high. You were talking about that before the camera. Oh, junior high. It was awful. Let's see, it was seventh and eighth grade. Ninth grade, I went to high school. I had a freshman class then. But, uh, Seventh and eighth grade, our junior high was the same color as San Quentin that was across the bay, and it, it served it perfectly. It was a horrible place. There were a lot of black kids there that kept getting flunked. So you'd have an 18-year-old guy in junior high, and if you look, you didn't have to look funny or anything. They just pummel you, you know, for the fun of it. I'd be walking down the hall one day with bunches of kids, and I had an armload of books, and one of these dudes went by and whacked me in the chest, knocked me down all my books. Oh, oh that was great fun, you know. You know, uh, scared to death. If you got caught out on the playground, it was all asphalt in that school, except for one circular bit of grass that you weren't allowed to touch. <laughs> and, uh, and these, if you got caught out on that playground, those, uh, those guys beat you to a pulp just for fun. So every day at lunchtime for those two years, I would run up to the library and read books. And I got, so I would read seven books in five school days. Everything from Space Cat for, to For Whom the Bell Tolls by Ernest Hemingway. And, uh, yeah. I, I build up such a vocabulary and a, and a feel for language that in the ninth grade we were all tested for our reading and comprehension. And I was number two in the whole school. Some girl was better than me, but, you know, and, uh, and that's what got me through English in high school and through uh, college, frankly. I, I couldn't uh, parse a sentence, I wouldn't know how to diagram one, I hardly knew a noun from a verb, but I could read a sentence and know when it was right or not right. And so I got by. I didn't have to go to Bonehead English or any of that at the Y. And, uh, and it ser has served me well until I had my mini strokes in 96 and lost about a third of that vocabulary, I think. And the ability to pull up words uh, are still difficult for me since then. But junior high was a nasty time as far as I was concerned. We were bussed in. We'd catch a bus in Point Richmond. They'd bring us downtown to the junior high. And the walk from the bus station to the school could be hazardous. 
there were guys waiting to just for fun to grab you and throw you in the thorny bushes alongside. And uh, but I had I had some black friends, and I remember one time these guys grabbed me to throw me in the thorny bushes. My black friends came over and beat the crap out of them, scared them off, you know. And uh, I didn't have to worry about it after that. But uh, Roosevelt Junior High. This would be the 50s? I guess, yeah. Well, yeah, I graduated high school in 1962, so junior high would have been in the 50s. And uh, things were a lot different then, you know. I remember uh, the coach uh, bringing us all in at uh, PE, and he had this smoking machine. He put all these cigarettes in it and it would smoke it and run through a filter. And he'd pull out and show you what was on your lungs if you smoked. Mm. All the tars <laughs> and that. And uh, I don't know that it discouraged very many, but uh, I was already a believer in not smoking, so it didn't change that for me. Uh, I remember one of these older kids got in a fight with that coach and took off and the coach chased him for about a mile until he caught him and beat him up. <laughs> so it was a tough school, man. I, you know, uh, I did not like it. It was not fun. Uh, I barely got by. There was this guy called Edmund Cleveland, a greaser, missing a tooth from fighting. And they, since his was Cle I was child, he was Cleveland, they always set him right behind me. He'd sit there and hit me behind the hip, you know, poke me and do all kinds of stuff, want, you know, to provoke me. And he was a nasty dude. I was so glad come high school. I think he got arrested or killed. I don't know. But he didn't. He was only there for a couple days in high school, then he was gone. And I was pretty much bullied in junior high. I was afraid of everybody. There was this one Mexican kid with big hair like this, you know. Called him Pachooks. I don't know. <laughs> Not politically correct, but that's what we called them. They had all this grease in their hair and that. And uh, he used to bully me and all that. And then one day I saw in the showers at junior high a skinny little kid with those big hair. I laughed and laughed, and he never bullied me again. <laughs> he would look so stupid. And uh, but when I got to high school, I thought I'm not going to be bullied again. That's it. Well, there was this guy that hung on, hung around with this Edmund Cleveland, and uh, he was in my, uh, one of my uh, PE classes. And he started to mess with me, thought he did there when Edmund was there, so he could. And I turned around, and I took a swing at him, just missed him, took a haymaker, you know. And his eyes got big, he never messed with me again, you know. Matter of fact, in high school we played football together and I played and he didn't. I remember after a game one time, coming home, I was all muddy and everything. It was great getting muddy playing football. And he, his suit was pristine clean. He borrowed some of my mud to smear on his suit so his dad wouldn't see him like that. <laughs> but uh, I never got bullied in high school. I, I just decided it wasn't going to happen anymore. It's, and it's true, if, uh, if you're being bullied, you stand up to them, and they, they back off. So I don't know what uh, high school I had my car. I'd earn enough, well first I earned enough money uh, uh, unloading trucks that I bought myself a motor scooter when I was 14. It was legal to drive a motor scooter at 14. And I drove that thing everywhere. We called it the pig. It was, it was, uh, we, I spray painted it gold. It was an ugly Cushman and uh, had two gears, low and high. And uh, one day Richard and I, I don't know why, we decided to shave our heads. And so we shaved our heads bald, put hats on and went out down driving. You didn't have all the Hondas and motorcycles like that then. So it was unusual. People would look when you'd go by in the motor school. They'd look, we'd take our hats off, and say, hi. <laughs> oh, yeah. uh, and I uh, had, a, had a party uh, that night. Uh, a, a 
church party up at the Parsons' house, and all the girls put on lipstick and kissed our heads all over, you know. <laughs> his mother, I don't think, ever forgave me for that, her beautiful little boy, all his hair shaved off, you know, like it was, like I <laughs> made him do it, you know. Then, then when Richard's I... Richard's mother was horrified. Your mother took it all in, in stride, but he, she only had one child, and he... Yeah, he was an only child, so she was horrified. My mom, eh, you know. <laughs> well, she had, you know, you had Maxine and her <laughs> purple hair. Yeah, on, yeah, on yeah Ma the, Maxine. But she was lime green when she was on the, uh, the yeah, the date. What was it? The uh, the guy before before Carson. Yeah, before Carson. Uh, she, Jack Parr. Jack Parr. Yeah, uh, he had his show out of San Francisco. <clears throat> Maxine had a job working for a hairstylist that would do all these different alcoholic drinks, drinks. and he did her color in cream de mint. <laughs> it was, I guess, purple or no, green. Green. green with sprinkles in it green. and stuff. And mom and her went to the Jack Parr show, and Jack Parr's live, you know. He's talking, it's unfortunate, it's black and white TV, and he stops talking, he looks in the office. Audience and he stops for all. He stops again. He says, hey, "Come up here." And Maxine come up on stage, and he had to describe it since it's all black and white. And she told him why she had that color hair and all that. And uh, so she was on the Jack Parr show, and uh, she went. She was in high school. Went to school. They kicked her out. She was too much of a distraction with that hair. She had to clean, get it out of her hair before she'd come back. See, after all that, you know, shaking your head, it's no big deal. No big deal. No <laughs> big deal. Then uh, I earned enough money to get a real motorcycle. I was 15. Well, you had to be 15 and a half with a learner's permit to drive a motorcycle. But I wasn't quite 15 and a half, and I got this uh, old Allstate uh, Craftsman, you know, motorcycle. Uh, there, you didn't have a lot of choices then like you do now. Uh, you had BSA and you had Triumph. And then there was this, mine was weird. It was a two-cycle motorcycle, had two pistons and one spark plug. <laughs> <coughs> it would go down, one piston came up, they would meet at the same time. One was the exhaust and one was the power piston. And, but... Uh, wasn't long, well, first of all, my brother, who was jealous, of course, older brother says, you can't drive that till you're old enough. I said, right, right. As soon as he left, got on it, took off, you know, I drove it everywhere. <laughs> and uh, pretty soon it had a, the ele electrical went bad on it. So we worked on it, I got this magneto that would put a spark out about that long. And I, I went to a welding shop and they welded a a, bra a, a sprocket on my crank, and I had a little chain up to that magneto, and I'd stick my finger in and, and turn it till it was about a quarter inch from top dead center. <coughs> I'd set the magneto spark there, put it all together, and it took off. Boy, that thing was powerful after that. I could do a wheelie in the first three years, you know? I even raced those high powered BSAs and, and uh, the small ones and, and beat them. So, I drove that all over the place. Uh, uh, I can remember coming to school one day and it was raining and the light changed and I hit the brake and skidded sideways right on through the intersection. Luckily no cars hit me, I went through. Uh, I, I drove it no matter what the weather was. Then I got my car. I was 16, earned enough money, and I bought this neighbor's car. It was a 1954 Mercury. He had molded off all the chrome so it was nice and smooth. There wasn't even a key for the trunk. You had to pull a, a lever in the back window to pop the trunk. And a real clean machine, lowered a little bit in the front. And uh, Did you have that all the way till you went on your mission? Uh, until just before my mission, I did, yes. And, uh, I remember you were telling me about driving that through like the hill, the roads around Lake Berryessa. Oh no, no, that I guess I 
Okay, let's get it in order. I had this 54 Merc all through high school. And uh, we put on these mufflers so they can blah, 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 make all this noise. This is an automatic, you know. And I'm coming down off the on-ramp, drop it in low, goes, <laughs> I blew the transmission, the, the torque converter, <laughs> coasted into my buddy's service station that happened to be at the bottom there. And we worked for a couple days pulling out the transmission, went to the junkyard, got a stick shift and put in there. And uh, we had to cut a hole in the floor. We didn't have the money to buy a, a, a conversion kit for a shifter on it <laughs> at first. So, But we had the stick shift. We wanted to go racing. So we'd go up and down the main racing everybody. My buddy would, would get down there. You had two levers on your transmission. You'd, they'd be in neutral. You'd put one in for first. Then to go to second, you had to pull that one out and pull the other one into second. And so I'd, I'd, we'd be in first, we'd go up to guy and start racing. Oh, I'd say, get ready! And Dick would jump down on the floor, <laughs> put his hands out, all this <laughs> roaring coming up on the transmission. Set, go! And I hit the clutch, I kick, 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 go! Pop it and go, you know? <laughs> yeah. well, that was a terrible thing to do. It was, we drove it like that for a long time. Finally, I got enough money together for a a shifter, but I couldn't afford the Hurst. That was the top of the line, the Hurst shifter. I got some knockoff, and it, it would jam on me all the time. You had to square those shifts or it would jam. And I was trying to teach my girlfriend how to drive, <laughs> and she would jam it every time. I had to get out and knock things around to get it back into neutral and drive again, you know. But uh, I really loved that car. Then it, I was, uh, I had three accidents in it. One accident, I, uh, I was at a stoplight and a guy, I was stopped and the guy hits me from behind, boom. Okay. Another accident, I'm uh, at a gas station. I'm at a gas station parked across there and this guy's car got away from me, boom, hits me. Another one, I'm going through an intersection, this guy runs a stop sign and hits me, boom. My insurance canceled me because of these accidents, like I had anything to do with it. But anyway, after these accidents, my whole back end was crumpled up and I went to Uncle Jay and said, can we fix this? He used to do body work. Those were like your last traffic accidents for your life, weren't they? <laughs> you never had another traffic accident. Not that I... Not that he's admitting to. <laughs> Not that I can think of. But, uh, it weren't exactly my fault, you know. I'm, I'm parked, you know, uh, legally. Anyways, your your back end was just it's all crumpled up. So he says, "Yeah, we can fix it. You get in the junkyard and get me a right rear quarter panel." And so I went down the junkyard. They could still find 54 Mercs there. They cut me out a quarter panel, and we come back, and Uncle Jay takes off the trunk, and we he cuts that whole section out. So. I got this whole back of my car missing. I got a couple lights in there to work for blinkers because he could only do it a little bit each day, you know. And I'm going, I'm pulling off the freeway and this highway patrol pulls me over. And he looks at that, he says, are you junking this or restoring it? <laughs> <laughs> but uh, we eventually got it fixed and and uh, painted back up again, and I uh, eventually sold that to a, a, a neighbor, and I bought this Austin Healy from a kid I knew. It was a 1954, and now what I didn't realize so much as I do now, that was a classic. A 1954 Austin Healy was a four-cylinder, when they came right off the British uh, lines and went over to Europe and all the road races won them all. It was fantastically more powerful and handled better than any of the others. It had a windshield. You could undo it here, lift it up, and put it down in the other sockets. And it was that high off of the, from the steering wheel. So you know, high speed racing, you know, you wouldn't have so much wind resistance. And, but when I bought it, it barely ran. And uh, that's the one that you were taking around Berryessa. Taking what? That you were driving on the roads around Berryessa. Yeah. 
Oh, it, but it barely ran when I got it. Uh, and I took it down to the yard, and, and with Uncle Jay's help, I dropped the pan, and we pulled the pistons out, and the rings came out in piles. <laughs> they were all broken and everything. So we sent the head out to get it reworked, uh, and I got new high compression pistons and rings, and we put those in and everything. Got the heads back. They were so bad, they said they had to put big Ford valves in it so it would breathe real good, you know. And uh, put that thing together, and it was hot. If I hit second gear hard, I would bang the back end on the ground, bang, like that. And I would race newer Austin Heaney's with the six cylinders and wipe them out, clean them, like that, clock like that. This was a two-seater. There wasn't, there was only room for the top behind you when you took the top down. And uh, I could sit in that and actually drag my fingers on the ground. It was so low. I'd get in that and it was like getting into it. I don't know, laying down. My feet disappeared. You had to know where the pedals were. You couldn't see them. And uh, I, I loved that car. I drove it uh, for a year or so before my mission. And if I had realized what I had, I would have put it in eight ball shop up on blocks, took the battery out, and put a tarp over it. And, uh, but I didn't, and I was being all spiritual. I said, Dad, sell this to help finance my mission. Well, well Ron had it, and Ron loaned it to Richard, and Richard let his girlfriend drive it, and she wrecked it. So we never saw the Healy again. That thing today, I could buy a house with what that's worth. <clears throat> but that's the way it went. Uh, I used to. It had a upgraded transmission. Not the original was a four-speed. This had a five-speed with overdrive or four-speed with overdrive. I don't remember. But it it had legs. I could get up to 110 with that, and I swear it steered better at 110 than it did at 30 because the wind and the aerodynamics on that. And I'd go up by Lake Berryessa and just find all the windy roads I could. And uh, I was lucky I was going on my mission. I think that's what saved my life. I took my na neighbor friend and we went up to the hills around the Oakland Temple with it. There's those windy mountain roads up above the Oakland Temple. And we were driving around those, enjoying the curves. And we pulled over to look at the scenery, and this Corvette comes by, throws rocks on us, and screams by, brand new one. So I start out after him. And on the straightaway, he'd pull away, you know, big V8. Then we'd get to the corners, and I was right on his tail. Beep, 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 beep. You know? <laughs> and then he'd go straight away, pull away, and I'd get on his tail. Beep, 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 beep. And then we came to a big, there's a big intersection up there, all about four roads that converge. It's all asphalt. And we got into there, and I spun a Brody and headed off down one, and he chased me. And I left him so far behind that when I got back down to the... Uh, there was a store across the freeway from the temple, and we pulled in there and got out real quick and just looked real cool. I was shaking like a leaf because I'd taken those corners at 55, 60, and four-wheel drifts. You know, I had, <coughs> we didn't have radial tires, we had rag tires. What year uh, Austin Healy again? Uh, 1954, Austin Healy. And uh, the, those tires would handle different than radials. You sold that? You let them sell that thing? I'll show you. Let me look at the pictures later. But first, this thing, when I would go into a corner with these tires, you could come in a corner at, say, 55 or 60, hit that gear down, redline the motor, and put your foot in it, and the back wheels would spin, and all four wheels would go around that corner while the back wheels are spinning. The four-wheel drift. And that vet couldn't come close to him, you know. He'd just be all over the place. And we got down there at the bottom, and this vet, the guy in the vet would come down. He came down and says, well, he had racing gloves and a roll bar and everything. I got my little Austin Healy. He said, well, my, uh, my vet just wasn't running right. I said, well, my, my four-cylinder Austin Healy was. <laughs> I tried to be cool while my knees were knocking because all the adrenaline, you know. <laughs> we used to go up there and run, and I did crazy things up there. Oh, terrible things. I wanted to 
I love that four-wheel drift, you know? And I'd get behind a slower car and I'd pass them on a corner. Idiot, you know? There weren't many cars on there, but I only took one, you know, and I'd have been dead meat. And, uh, but I was going on a mission soon, so I guess the Lord preserved me for it, because he certainly saved my life on my mission. But that was one cool sports car. Let me see the picture you got there. Oh, I just got a bunch of them. What color was yours? <laughs> Glasses or your mom's? Yeah, I do that. Oh yeah, oh yeah. Austin Healy. There it is right there. Was that the color it was? No, it was red. Well, I mean, they're, these are all just 54 Austin Healy's, so maybe more like that one or that one? Boy. It had a it had a bumper. It had oh, spoke wheels with these yet. knockoff hubs. That for okay. a road rally, if you got a flat, you pulled over and you hit it with a hammer and spun the thing off. You take the wheel off, throw another one, and spin it back and hit it with a hammer. You didn't have to do any lug nuts. I mean, you one spinner lug. Yeah, big rubber hammer. So there it is with the windshield knocked down. Yeah, yeah. And uh, the spoke wheels and everything. Oh. I mean, that was a cool machine, boy, I'll tell you. And it, uh, and this, see, the 54 had a unique grill. It was different than the later ones. But, like I said, it ate up everyone that year on the European tracks. Ah, I should have kept that. Today I could buy a house with what it's worth, I'll tell you. But I probably couldn't fit in it today. <laughs> Uh, it was a tighter fit than my Z is. I, I used to, prior to my mission, I was working for, it was slow at 8-Ball, so he loaned me out to another trucking company that was hauling fruit. And uh, I'd drive, haul fruit for, I don't know, 12 hours or more, and then drive home. And I had my big work boots on, and I'd get in that Austin Healy, a hard time not to press the clutch and the brake at the same time, you know, with those boots. They're little and down there you couldn't see. Yeah, prior to my mission, right prior to my mission, I, I hauled peaches. And I was the newest driver, and uh, they all had these Peterbilts. Nice truck, except mine was older than old. It was real loose in the steering, it was hard to keep it on the road and everything. And uh, we'd go pick up the peaches down like in Marysville and bring them back to Richmond to the cannery that was there and get in line, pull them up and unload. And uh, I was coming back with a load of peaches one day. You know, it's hot, the windows are down. On the viaduct, we had to go across a two-lane viaduct. It was pretty tight. Where was suddenly, this viaduct? Coming back from Marysville to Richmond. Oh, okay. Anyway. Somewhere around Sacramento at that time, but it's probably not even there anymore now. I think it was two lane or something. And I'm trying to keep from going over the edge, you know, driving, and suddenly there's a truck beside me. What? Look over there's one of the other drivers. He starts throwing peaches at me. What? Who happened to me with peaches? I'm trying to drive. I'm all ready to crash, you know. He said, Oh, look at that. Uh, Tell him about the time that we went into San Francisco with a load of tar. Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's back where we had kids. We were married. We were married, and we were, uh, I was working there trying to earn money to get back to school. And they sent me with a load of tar over to in, the docks. In the cardboard? No, they were in metal containers. Oh, metal containers. And they were ugly because they'd spill over and all that nasty stuff. And, and I come up there, and there's a big line of trucks, and I'm pulling up there, so, oh. What's on? These guys said, forget it. They're waiting for some important load. You're going to be here until they get here. I said, well, I, I better check in. So I went up there, and the guy looked at my paper and says, get it up here now. This stuff has to come at the bottom of the ship. <laughs> I'm driving by all those guys and up there. Oh, there he goes. You know, that was the important load that had to go down the bottom first. They weren't going to put that tar above the good stuff, you know. <laughs> it was the ballast load. Yeah, yeah, and they unloaded us in a hurry, and we were out of there. <laughs> that, that was fun. The, all the drivers always commented on this good-looking gal I had with me, climbing around on the loads and that. Oh, yeah, back when you had a good-looking gal. <laughs> it was, it was uh, good times, good times. And 
I was trying to earn all the money I could, so I would get up early in the morning and, and drive all day long. I mean, real early, two, three in the morning, and go to work. Then I would come back and drive down to Walnut Creek where we had an old truck there and trailers where they were loading pears all day in Pacheco. That was all pear country then. And uh, so I'd tie it down and then uh, I don't know how we got together and someone would meet, take you down to the truck or yeah, what. Yeah, your mom probably drove me down. This is, and this is our honeymoon. This is right after we're married. Right after we're married. And uh, I came with a plate of food. Yeah, whatever they had for dinner, she had a plate, mashed potatoes, gravy, the whole works, you know. And uh, she'd get in the truck with me and I'd head off to San Jose to the cannery there. And she would feed me on <laughs> driving, you know, a bite of this, a bite of that. And so we, and I would get back about, about, midnight. about midnight and have to get up at three again, you know, and I'm, I'm wiped out. Well, this is my honeymoon. <laughs> yeah, we got the little travel trailer on the side of the house, and so he said, oh, yeah. I said, no, leave me alone, leave me alone, I got to sleep. <laughs> so he but, made me go in the house and sleep in Candy's room. <laughs> yeah. I, had to. I, I knew if I didn't get a few hours, I was going to die on the road somewhere. It was awful. <laughs> Uh, it was like that for the first two weeks, and then we went back to school. We went to BYU, and had our honeymoon, honeymoon there. there. But uh, I, I that week, I think I earned two hundred dollars. Oh yeah, that and was for big a, money for a, a wedding gift. Sid didn't take out any taxes, so I got a check for two hundred bucks. Big money, you know. And your folks gave us each a hundred dollar bill for a wedding gift. So we had $400. Who was it that gave you the sack of potatoes? Oh, well, a well, missionary that lived with oh. them. Yeah, see, they had the nice cottage, the missionaries. That's why we had to sleep in the camp trailer. trailer. Yeah. No bathroom. And uh, one of the missionaries was from Idaho, and he had his folks send me a, us a 100-pound bag of potatoes. But so, we had to pay the shipping. It still cost us $4.50. But while we were there, on living on nothing for a while at school, I'll tell you, we had mashed potatoes, baked potatoes, scalloped potatoes, french fries, uh, baked potatoes, I don't know, all kind, any kind of potato, because that was our main food. Uh, For a while. Yeah. That was your staple. She would, she'd go out and buy a pound of hamburger and divide it five ways, or six, I don't know. Mm -hmm. And then, I think we got a pound and a half of hamburger, and I divided it in six packages. And we'd mix it with potatoes or something. Or rice or noodles. She made chili once. Best chili I ever had. She's never made it that good since. I was probably starving. <laughs> <laughs> you probably remember it better than it actually was. <laughs> but uh, we, while we were there, we were in an apartment with a big oven. and the, A full-size stove. Yeah, the, the ward had a party. Well, it was a Thanksgiving thing. With, they wanted to make sure all the people in the ward had some kind of a had Thanksgiving, even if they, because they, not everybody went back home for Thanksgiving. So they, uh, mm -hmm. student board, yeah. Yeah. So they asked Sylvia to bake this turkey in her oven. Well, they asked for volunteers, anybody who had an apartment that had an oven big enough to put a turkey into, and we did. And that thing was cooking all the time, smelled so good. And I had to go to work. I didn't get to go to the party and eat any of that thing. <laughs> it was terrible. You, Mom, you were telling about how you didn't know how to cook a turkey. I just cooked it like a big chicken. <laughs> I knew how to bake a chicken, so I just baked it like it was a big chicken, and it turned out really good. And I made a stuffing. My mother had sent us a care package one year, and, well, like at Christmas, she sent all our Christmas gifts wrapped in lengths of material instead of wrapping paper. So I had fabric to work with, but... She had sent us a care package and it had raisins in it and I was trying to think of something creative to do with the turkey and the raisins and I put it in some stuffing and you know the rest of the story. <laughs> I don't want stuffing without raisins. That, it's not good without raisins. 45 you're, you're. years later, so now you know where we got that one started. <laughs> but yes, we I think they had two turkeys and I got to bake one of them. Now, we would splurge every so often and buy a chicken for Sunday dinner. Oh, roast beef. No, I remember chicken. 
and it, invariably the Espersons would oh, come by. Oh, it was the roast beef. <laughs> they would always come by and we'd have to share it with them. It was awful. <laughs> Dave and Celeste. They just knock on our door and they seemed to know the day that we were having something good. <laughs> they probably went by, let's go visit the child. <laughs> so, but, uh, See, they probably tell their stories about how they were so destitute and uh -huh. <laughs> you guys helped them out. Uh, uh, the days that, that they were starving, didn't have anything, they just happened and that's when they showed well, up. Well, it was always a Sunday because it was a nicer meal than just a little pat of hamburger. We were newly married and Valentine's Day came. Oh. And I came home and Sylvia got surlier and surlier and finally started bawling. I've I would, never done it since. And I, what's wrong? <sighs> She wouldn't tell me for a long time, then finally she said, You didn't thank me for the Valentine. Valentine? Well, the main thing was, he didn't do anything for me for Valentine's Well, neither did you for me, as far as I knew. Uh, then we finally uncovered some stuff, and there was her Valentine underneath it. I'd never seen it. I had made for him. But I didn't even get so much as a, as a little kiss and a squeeze and said, Happy Valentine's Day, honey. He's just oblivious to these things. Maybe. But I have learned since then not to expect it. Or if I feel like I want something, I either go buy it for myself or tell him to go. <laughs> you keep All reminding I... me it's Valentine's Day. Do you know how many marriages would be saved if the, if the wife would just do that? <laughs> we missed an awful lot of afternoon classes at BYU. Oh, <laughs> we, we'd we come home real quick and... <laughs> <laughs> and then, oh, we're late, I forget the classes. Yeah. Well, we had, I had an 8 o'clock class, and it was one of those classes that was more like a, the professor stood up front and the place was bigger than a chapel and packed. And so it was just a, a class you go in and take a lot of notes and everything. And I got a D in that class because it was so hard to get to school at 8 o'clock in the morning. I never signed up for another 8 o'clock class. <laughs> There was um, a physics, no, yeah, a physics class, and it's just right over my head anyway. We, uh, for a while, I had a job, well, first, the, the first job I had was, uh, we still got time on that thing? Yeah, it's still going. Okay. It looks like it's been going an hour and a half. Uh, my first, one of my first jobs here was another half hour. at the Pizza Palace, oh. and I had a big window in front. We'd roll out the pizza and throw it up in the air. People would watch and we'd cook it right there. I guess pizza was a luxury at that time, wasn't oh. it? Oh, it was yeah. for us. <laughs> well, I could have pizza there, but I couldn't make it and take it home. I mean, I couldn't eat any of the pizza that he ate. So, but anyway, uh, I worked there, and and I was being groomed to be the manager when the manager graduated and left. And that was more money and a better job. And, uh, but they had this waitress that had been there since before the manager was. And her and I did not get along like that, you know. And we were getting ready to come home for Christmas. I had it all set up. I got off it on uh, Christmas Eve, was it? Mm -hmm. Or the day before Christmas yeah, Eve? Yeah, about the 23rd, I think. And uh, we were going to highball back to California. And then I'd have my job and I got back. And that dude fired me my last day there. He fired me. I was devastated. I was making $1.23 an hour. That was yeah, big money. Yeah, I was... Uh, you were making 99 cents. I was so. making a dollar. I was um, home in bed asleep so that I could drive the first leg and when he got home that he could sleep in the car for a while. And so I got home and we've only been married a few months. What am well, I going to tell this? This was August. I mean we got married in August and this was December, our first Christmas. What am I going to tell this almost a stranger that <laughs> I, I lost my job, I got fired, you know? I was humiliated. They, they didn't give you a reason for it, did they? No. I asked him why. He kind of mumbled something but uh, I just, I was devastated. And I came home, so he was in the bedroom, and I sat down in the living room. I didn't know, what am I going to say? What am I going to do? And she called out to me. She was awake. She had heard me come in. Now, what, what, what are you doing? <laughs> we need to get going. You know, you're just sitting in there. So I came in, and, 
and sat down next to her on the floor next to the bed. And, and uh, I don't know, I probably started bawling. Probably did. I felt so bad, you know. So later that morning, we called home and said... So what we decided, that we weren't going to go home. We needed to stay there and get another job. Find a job. Yeah, we needed to do the right thing. And uh, we called home. You tell them what they said. Well, they basically said, you're not going to find a job right now anyway. Come on home. You know, come home for Christmas. You're not going to find a job the And they were going to help us Christmas. out with some money. Oh, I don't remember that part, but I'm sure that happened. Oh, yeah, because we wouldn't have had anything when we got back. And uh, I think they... So we started driving. Yep. So the uh, that was one of the big dips in our marriage. That was actually kind of a high point. It turned out to be a high point. But it was, <laughs> it was at the time it was devastating. But uh, when I got back for a while... Oh, when we got there... His mom took us shopping so that we would have a present under the tree. <laughs> she took me to the store and I got him a pair of new shoes, some hush puppies. And she took David to the store and he got me a real cute green coat, bright green, and it was a furry, fuzzy thing. Because she didn't have a good coat for the winter. And uh, tell him about Dad and the chocolates. Oh, that's later. That's after we've been married a while. Well, we were still poor as can yeah. be going to school. Yeah, it was a graduation gift. And Dad gave her a, what is it, a five pound? Four pound, four pound box, box of seized, seized chocolates. chocolates. Sylvia was livid. She needed a new bra. She didn't need a box of chocolates, you know? It was such a frivolous gift when we were. But see, that's short his on dad. Everything. He's, he's impulsive. He wanted to do something nice. You know, he had the money to do it, and... <laughs> so, but we lived very, very frugally at school. We were poor as could be. And uh, I finally got a job. And I got a job at the hospital mopping floors. And it was actually, I think, a better job than the pizza place. Cause oh, yeah, you were making a dollar a quarter an hour or something and, like that. And I got, uh, I got time towards paid vacation. I earned four days paid vacation by the time before I left there. Mm. I thought it was a great job, you know? And uh, they put me up in OR, and I'd have to dress in scrubs like the doctors and, and mop the floors after the operations and the ceilings, because sometimes they'd hit an artery and squirt all the way up to the ceiling, you know? And, uh, and I'd bring him dinner in the evening, and he'd come down in his scrubs, and it was, woohoo, he looks just like a doctor. <laughs> and. Uh, I could watch the operations through a porthole, you know. I watched a C-section once, and they uh, they cut this woman over. Oh, and he reached down in there up to his elbows in the woman's belly and pops up this purple baby. Oh, <laughs> oh, 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 why am I watching? <laughs> and uh, I know they were practical jokers because they. I would assist, like if they were doing a big body cast, I'd come, they'd have me come in and hold the guy while they cast them and everything. They needed extra help. Well, one day they called me in, and here's all the nurses standing around, the doctor, and they said, uh, we got a woman here, we want to, she was knocked out, we want to roll her into your arms, and you got to lift her over because we got to operate on her back, got a, a kidney thing. So, okay, she's laid on her back. They whip off the sheets, and she's bare naked. Good looking woman. Uh, you want me to handle that? <laughs> I leaned over like that. They rolled her into my arms. I lifted her over out of the table. And those nurses must have been going. <laughs> it was, you know, it was funny. Now that I look at it, it was, it was kind of embarrassing then, though. But that was one of my best jobs I had. Uh, later on, to get more hours, I went out of OR down to the main floor and worked. And it used to bug me because the guys that worked in the kitchen got free food. But I'd have to come in there and mop their floors and I didn't get free food. It was maddening. It drove me crazy. <laughs> and uh, I, I got Sylvia a better job when I was there. Talked to someone. They needed someone over at the bakery. bakery. So she went over and interviewed and got the job. 
made raisin cookies her favorite. Mm -hmm. She so. used to bring me home a raisin cookie now and then. Oh, it was so good. But being poor doesn't make things bad. Being poor just meant that you were you pulled closer together and worked harder for a common goal, at least for us, because we were definitely poor. Uh, we got back a uh, income tax return for 50 bucks. Sylvie so says, we're rich. So I said, just a minute, and I went and cashed it, and I went and bought a car. She said, what did you do that for? We got a car. I said, wait, wait, wait. So I, I got the car home, and I... You I sold, sold a, pint a pint of, of blood. blood. Oh, I sold a pint of blood to get some tools. $20. I didn't have any tools. And uh, I, I got an old license plate and wire, and I patched up the muffler, and I did this and that, a few things, and sold it for $75. Sold it before the, the title would change, so they, it was like they bought it from the original one, so I'd have to do that. Sylvie saw that and said, do it again! Do it again! <laughs> At one point in time, we had three cars, and I thought we were going to have to teach the dog how to drive because <laughs> there was only the two of us. <laughs> oh, our dog. We had Sammy. Sammy he was, was a Chihuahua kid. mix. You got a picture of him downstairs. Yeah. yeah. He was a pretty dog. He wasn't all bug-eyed and nervous all the time. But we, w we came home one day from church, and Sylvia had baked a cherry pie. <laughs> oh. And... And we put it on the table. And covered it. Yeah, put a dishcloth on top of it. We and came home and it was... Smushed. Smushed. <laughs> what happened to the cherry pie? We couldn't figure it out. We, we ate it. But, uh, <laughs> of course. Then one day we, we came home and caught Sammy jumping up on the table off to the window. Look outside to find us. <laughs> it was on the cherry pie jumping up and down. I'm glad it was covered. <laughs> <laughs> we ate it and didn't know any better. Poor Sammy. He didn't realize he was a chihuahua and he got ate up by a shepherd. That, you know, was a, such a sad time. It was our first child to die. And after that, dogs were dogs. They weren't children yep. anymore. Yep. I've never gotten attached to another dog. Any more than you would to a dog, not like it was to Sammy. But well, why? But why did you get attached to Sammy that way? Because we didn't have any I mean, kids. He was our first kid. Oh, we we took him to church parties. We took him shopping. We just he was our kid. That's actually a common thing for uh, childless couples. They they get really attached to pets, especially a little this one. Is the camera. A little <laughs> one, a little one that uh, you know you could carry around and fuss over and everything. And if we were gone. He would go into the laundry basket and get our garments out and drag them around because they smelled the most like us is all I can figure. He'd be comforted by them. Yeah, we had that basement apartment. We managed the building for the woman that owned the house and that way we got our our rent cut down and plus I saved money on the rent by painting the house and stuff like that. We did everything we could to keep things together. And then you would see these kids that came there from rich families. They had to be rich families because they would take the skiing classes. And they had all the ski gear and everything. They'd trounce off all these buses and go up, take their ski classes. And thought, God, well, even if they that? weren't in class, they'd go skiing. Yeah, well, you not know, us. We couldn't have afforded the price of a lift, much less the equipment to we ski back down. <laughs> But you know, those were some of the best days. Talk about more, talk about more about your childhood days. What? I mean, how long was it? Okay, at BYU, it was so tough um, for some. You know, I want to skip this part. I'm gonna leave. No, 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 no. just stick around. This is for posterity. Oh. They, uh, I, we were in a Sorry, BYU school. ward. Student ward. Camera was going to dump out in about 20 minutes. And, and people would, of course, like us, would get married and stay in the ward. That's what we did. And uh, she had friends in the ward, and they were close, she thought. And they would get pregnant, and they, they would join a different clique. Sylvie couldn't be a part of it because she didn't get pregnant. And so it would just ball and ball. I didn't know what to do.
I was doing everything I could, but I didn't know what to do. And, uh, and uh, every month it was the same thing, ball and ball, because she wasn't pregnant. Then she did get pregnant. And then she lost, lost the child early before it was formed. She took the mass up to the hospital and they confirmed it was a miscarriage. Actually, we had health insurance. We had Mutual of Omaha for some reason. Mm. And that insurance for that miscarriage paid for an electric typewriter, so that was our first baby, our Smith Corona <laughs> typewriter. But it was hard on Sylvia. I didn't care. She, you know, kids or no kids, I, you know. But it meant a lot to her and these, these friends. Just, she wasn't a part of the group anymore. I couldn't believe it. Women, you know? But, uh, so, then when we came, graduated and came back to California to, uh, well, first we moved to Sugar House and I was going to uh, go into real estate. But uh, Dad asked me to come back and join him in the business with him and Ron and me. And so we decided to do that. Uh, uh, this guy we were renting the house from, it was a big house, had a almost finished attic. All he needed was partner. All he needed was a refrigerator and a stove. And it it had done. a stove, but it was one of those old electric stoves and the whole thing was up on legs and everything. But, and it had its own entrance and back. And a bathroom. Yeah. And he would have sold that to us for $8,000, no interest. He had to move, go back east. He wanted to sell it and he liked us. And, ah. Uh, but we were going to California. I didn't know how we could manage it from California, so we didn't do it. <laughs> we went down, down and found that house. It's Years still ago. there. Yeah. It was on a lot big enough for, and zoned correctly for fourplexes. We could have tore it down and put a fourplex up there. Oh, we didn't know how to do all that. Well, no, but I was going to go into real estate and we were going to do all that. But we but, left. <laughs> One of the many missed opportunities in our lives, but... Uh, but while we were here, uh, mm -hmm. living there, um, that's where I was teaching school in Tuella. I taught fifth grade for two years. And two years gave me enough that I didn't have to recertify or anything. Um, but we moved to California and there was just a glut of teachers on the market. So I didn't even try to get a job, and I uh, wound up getting a job at Scotty's Bakery as a waitress. And in we there while we were at Tooele, the reason we moved to Tooele is because that's where she was teaching, and I had to go into the Army, in the Army Reserves. So was it your second year that I went in? No, it's the first year because our second year we were moving, we moved back to I mean, Salt your, Lake. Your second year of teaching. Right. The first year she from. commuted with someone. No. Yes, you drove all the way to Twill oh, from that was Sugar the House. Year, I thought. And the second year we moved there because I knew I was going to be gone and I didn't want you oh. driving that. And so that, this was during Vietnam. Yeah. Uh, so we we bought this. We looked around. We found an apartment. Before we even unpacked, there were cockroaches everywhere. We got our stuff together and got out of there. We didn't want those cockroaches and all our stuff. We went through everything to make sure they didn't get into it. And so we bought a, a, a single wide, 10 foot wide, 36 foot trailer house. Mobile home trailer. And uh, we didn't buy it there. We had it moved. I think so. We bought it from someone. I don't. Oh, I don't. Yeah, we bought it from the gal eating chocolates in her bikini. Remember? Yeah, reading reading <laughs> mag, love magazines. The thing didn't even have a heater in it. Talk about <laughs> dumb. Yeah. But and we had it towed up there to Twilla and put it on this uh, inexpensive uh, trailer park. There wasn't any pavement or anything, and uh, I went out and got a a heater that would fit in there and plumbed it all, and we had heat. And uh, 
but the pipes would always freeze, not to crawl underneath the candle. And we fall didn't out. know you wrap them in heat tape. Finally, one of our neighbors told us. And I got that done before I went to, to the Army. Then I had to go into boot camp and uh, AIT. I, I got to come home for Christmas. We drove back to California for Christmas, and then I had to go back. And when I got back, uh, so I, I got to the airport. Sylvia's working. No one's there. So I was at Salt Lake Airport, had to hitchhike home, you know, my duffel bag and all, my, my dress greens, I think they were then, and uh, got out there and hitchhiked first car, you know. Eddie got home. <laughs> You're a soldier, you know. Oh, and that trip home, by the way. Oh, uh, wait a minute. When, you, when the guy dropped you off and you were at the trailer, mm -hmm. he opened the door. And this little dog wouldn't let him in. He Look was protecting her. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I said, Sammy, don't you remember? Bill said, no. Oh. <laughs> he wiggled all over, peed on the floor. And loved him. So, but uh, dogs. To, to get home, we had to fly from the south up to Chicago O'Hara. And our plane was just a bit late. And they said, you got to run. It was clear across the other end. Good thing we were in shape, soldiers, you know. We had all our stuff, and we're running down there. And as we're running by, people with a radio would say, they're here at the gate, some of us, <laughs> oh, they're coming, you know. There was about three of us, or three or four of us, running like crazy. The plane had actually been pulled away from the, from the gate. gate, and they brought it back just for us. And we got in there, and they, we were flying. Uh, standby. Standby. <laughs> we got first class. <laughs> That was so cool, and uh, this wasn't the time when people were spitting on the soldiers when they came home. You know, you were treated well like they are now, respected as, as patriots, you know. I guess that movement didn't get started until like the late 60s? Yeah, if, if one of those broads had spit on me when I came up, I would have, I would have smashed her face right then. It would just wouldn't have been a question of it, it would have been done, you know. Uh, but anyway... We, uh, so I, we're back, I'm, I'm uh, in the Army Reserves, we're living in that little trailer, and uh, I got a motorcycle. I had it before I left, didn't mm -hmm. I? I had gotten Yamaha. This, no, a Honda. Oh, it was fine. a Honda uh, dirt bike, but it was so cool. It was such a brand new. Oh, I love that bike. I drove it. She wouldn't ride with me, but I... I'd take it all the way up in the hills around Tooele. I found Ophir Valley back there and followed that up there. All these mining towns and stuff. It was so f much fun. I even drove it to reserve meeting once. That was awful on those freeways. All the way over there and back. But uh, It was a cool bike. And when I, when I had to go in, uh, out to active duty, I, I put it up on blocks and covered it and back the trailer and everything. So it was there when I got back. We brought it to California. When we moved out to California, we got this, I bought this trailer made out of a pickup bed, and we were hauling it behind this Studebaker I'd bought. This, uh, uh, it was a, a, it was a fancy Studebaker, it was beautiful. It was like a race car sort of, you know, high performance, but anyway. And I packed everything in there. I finally, to get the motorcycle in, I took the front wheel off and the handlebars sideways, packed it in last with the wheel up there, closed it up, everything was tight as a drum. We got everything we owned in that trailer and in the car. And we had that Datsun then, and so she drove the Datsun, I drove the Studebaker with the trailer. Just like the Beverly Hillbillies almost, we came back to California. And, uh, and your aunt... Uh... Dorisida took us around looking for a house to buy and uh, wound up buying that house in Vallejo. Yeah, brand new one being built. And we stayed with his parents, only they changed the order in which they were building the houses. Something happened that they couldn't build them in the direction that they wanted, so they just reversed everything. And instead of having a house in a month, we had to wait six months for it to be built. And we lived in the cottage. It was, it was hard living with the folks now. Uh, it wasn't Mom, hard for me. <laughs> Mom was always 
telling me to treat Sylvia better and, and uh, yeah, see, <laughs> it wasn't hard for me. We, uh, that was the closest thing to marital problems I think we've ever had was when we lived there. Yeah, well, mom finally just had to back off and stay out of our life, you know, and then it was fine. But uh, yeah, we moved to Vallejo, and it was such a change, you know. At the Y, I was a rogue because I had a beard in the '60s. You couldn't have a beard on campus, but I did, and I was. They even said, went and chiseled a beard off of um, Brigham Young's statue. Yeah, but you know, they said they would not let you register if you had a beard. I went down anyway, and they registered me. You know, I was pretty defiant, and uh, we have a lot of letters to the editor, things that went back and forth. That time it was quite interesting. But of the uh, BYU. Newspaper. Yeah. Uh, I didn't give Wilkinson, the, the, the president of the university, his due, and uh, a lot of people objected to that. More of them agreed with me, though. But they fired the editor for, for putting that in the paper. <laughs> it wasn't the editor. He was gone, and the assistant editor put it in. <laughs> yeah, I took hand delivered it, he put it in, and he got fired for it because you don't say anything against Wilkinson. Then. A little tyrant up there, and uh, but after that, there were these all these replies come back. If you don't like it, move out. And then they would sign a false name, you know, the real brave folk, you know, and uh, <laughs> but then they had to allow me to reply after that because they had to let you reply to the replies. So it went on for a while. It was, and then there was this group that had a a paper they printed. Uh, it wasn't anti-Mormon. Kind of an underground. Paper. It was an underground paper, though, and and it didn't necessarily agree with everything that was BYU standards, you know. And they'd move the press every so often; they couldn't find it, you know. And they suspected some professor was helping them in this. And I got a call from that group. They wanted me to join. <laughs> they thought I was a real rebel rouser. I said, No, I don't want to do that. <laughs> but. Uh, it was such a shock when we went to a real ward in Vallejo, and uh, I had a beard, and they made me a teacher to teach the uh, teachers. Oh, but I got a beard. They didn't care. What's the what? <laughs> yeah. Oh, this is great. I taught. I taught those teachers, and they were so. We got so attached to each other that when they. They were all about the same age, and when they were made priest, they made me priest advisor. Yeah, and then they made me young men's president. Uh, so it was, it was the real world then. So yeah, BYU that's world. one of those young Junior men, are the ones that the who, who carved the shape of the truck with a plaque There's on it. Wrong with this one. That's in there on the wall for. Uh, yeah. yeah, we did road shows, like and road show. yeah. I hauled all their stuff around in a truck. Yeah. And they they cut a plaque of a truck and a and a brass plate inscribed to thanking me for hauling all their stuff around. You see, we were the only ward that had a truck to haul things around. Everyone else had to put them in multiple pickups. Yeah. So truck. I want to I want to go back and hear about your 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 dating. You skipped over all that. Well, I'm I'm actually just curious since we're on the subject of. of Vallejo right now. What, what were you doing for a living when you moved back to California? Uh, by then I, I joined Dad in the trucking business and I was driving a truck. Driving a truck. So when did, when did you take over as the, the owner of 8-Ball? Oh, that was, that would have been uh, in the 80s sometime. Okay. But uh, our dating years, well, but I just want to make sure we have enough time on this. Yeah, I don't know when we're going to run out. It's probably going to be, you know, it could be 10 minutes, could be 20 minutes, could be any moment. So. Okay, well, you watch it, would you? Sure, well, and, it'll uh, make a beep when it gets to that point. We, uh, I was looking for a wife. I was hoping for my mission. I wanted to get married. All I had to do was walk across this field of vision. That was it. Well, first, there was a girl across the street. Oh, wait, thinking. never mind. I think it says we have 32 minutes left. And I really got attached to her. She was older, she was working on her master's degree, and she was older than me, but I really liked her. She laughed a lot, and, and that, and uh, I was, 
I was shocked one day when I was taking her home and and to her apartment with the other girls and I said, see that couch? If that couch was was a girl, she'd be pregnant now or something like that. I said, wow. Like I say, she was a little bit older, more worldly. But she, she went home for Christmas and I was going to ask her to marry me when she got back. And her return missionary came home and they got married. Rats, you know, tore them right out of my arms. And uh, So we're back to looking. Yep, and uh, we had this ward party, a tubing party up there in the snow. And uh, I'm watching all the girls, of course, and Sylvia comes along and she has this sweatshirt. I brought it from my roommate. I didn't own anything like a sweatshirt. Never owned a pair of jeans or anything like that. I was a lady. And it had this face on the bleh. And I said, what does that say? And you said? It says bleh. I said, oh, I got to date her. <laughs> so I made sure my roommate knew. I never knew a Sylvia. I couldn't remember her name. Oh, gee. And, uh, and so when we, did I ask you on a date while we were there? Or? Wasn't no, there. you asked me, um, our ward was having a, a party and we, I was one of those in charge and we decided to have a carnival and with the lots of booths going on and everything and I was just running around like a chicken with my head cut off and he stopped me and asked me to go out with him and I was kind of frazzled, okay, okay. <laughs> Get them one they're not expecting. And the guard's yeah. down, huh? Yeah, <laughs> like that chicken. <laughs> but uh, then we, uh, I guess our first date must have been to go to a basketball game. Boy, if you survived a basketball game with me, you you had to be, we had to be loved because well, I went it, crazy. You know, wasn't the second one. Well, we hit each other. Yeah, but after the. First one, it was, it was a pretty bad date. I go home and he sits down and he looks at me and he gives me this list of things that he wants looking for in a wife and he's like, sit up, girl, and listen here because you're going to want to know what this is because I'm minute. great. We had already made arrangements on the next date, though, which was a big dance ahead of Coming time. Up. So we already had that date in line. And, and, and uh, it was a big affair. And I thought, well, I wasn't going to call him and say, I don't want to go to the dance with you because I had a crummy time last night and you're just a real creep. So um, I, I thought, we'll, we'll go to the dance because that was it. We're going to be done. And, and we quit being... It was the second date that before this dance that I told her what I wanted in a wife and that I was looking for a wife. And I, he'd already made the arrangements for the date for the dance. And she did not like that. <laughs> and he had a, a really good family, like he was the only one in the world that had a good family. I had a good family. And just, he was pretty lordly, you know. This is, this is what I want. He was through playing the dating game. I was so tired. I would, you'd ask some buff girl for a date and she's, oh, I got to check my... My schedule. Uh, geez, woman, I don't want... You know, they were, they were about this deep. The, the better, more buff they were, the shallower they were, it seemed. And it was just awful. I hated it. I hated the game. So it's, we went to the dance. And... We didn't care. We weren't out to impress each other. And we had one of the best times we've ever had in our life. It was just fun. We joked. And we didn't try to be, oh, prissy or lordly or anything. We were just ourselves. And Sylvia was in charge of cleanup. Yeah, I was on the cleanup committee. <laughs> so and I pitched in and helped clean up. Everything. He just got everything done so he could get me out of there and get me home. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> no, not to my house, to his house. <laughs> now. now, this was a date where he sent me a card to get... Instead of flowers, he sent me a hairstyle. Because the roommate was a hairstylist. And so he sent a card to me and paid for getting my hair fixed that night. 
and no flowers, but I got a hairdo out and of I it. And I think we had a steak dinner too, didn't we? No, that was another night, okay. later on. Another night, he didn't send me flowers, but he sent me a steak. <laughs> and his roommate, who was married and just taken some uh, one semester worth of classes there, so he didn't go to the dance. And, um, he, and his roommate cooked a steak dinner for him. It was us. a friend of Ron's. Yeah, who was living there too. Did you ever send her flowers? Oh, yeah, I sent you a corsage once. One. I don't remember. Oh, yeah. Sure, I did. She's still waiting. Yeah, she's still <laughs> waiting. <laughs> but uh, that third date, I finally had to take her home when the morning paper hit the front door. So uh, it was time to go home. <laughs> it was very successful. Date. Yes, I left hairpins scattered all over. <laughs> my roommates were on my case after, you can't do that. So, oh, yeah, tell me about it. And hers. Oh. Hers. Oh, it was my Aunt Kathy. It's she. Oh, you just, just to give the whole apartment a bad reputation. Now they think we're all those kinds of girls. And then. And but when Dennis came into her life, I never heard one little word about how late they were out or anything. <laughs> they stayed out late. Oh, yeah. So it was, it was kind of funny. But uh, um, Sylvia had made a promise she wasn't going to kiss anybody. Mm -hmm. Remember? Mm hmm. And uh, now we were pretty close this third date, and she wanted me to kiss her. I don't know, you don't want me to kiss her. <laughs> I teased her and get real close and rub so her I cheek. And finally just like grabbed him and planted one on him. <laughs> <laughs> and then that night ended when daylight broke. <laughs> we kissed there, we kissed there, we kissed everywhere. It was fun. Uh -huh. And uh, so that was, after that, then it was going too fast, and we said, look, it, we gotta, we got to stop dating for a while and give it some I wanted some to breather. not date for a month. He didn't want to just skip one weekend. And I thought, if, if we could separate for a month, then we don't have to see each other anymore. It'll blow over. But I talked her into a week. Well, it was. Uh, two weeks, two weeks. And, but funny thing... That all two weeks, I was like taking this guy back to Salt Lake. I said, well, you want to go for a ride? Sure. We're going. Yeah. And we saw more of each other then yeah, than we ever did weeks. dating. But they weren't dates. They I mean, dates. we'd go to the library and study, or we'd go up to the Wilkinson Center and study, or something like that. But they, they weren't dates. <laughs> and really. finally after... No, now I get to tell this part. Okay. So we are... He is looking for a wife, and, I, uh, and I'm just a a up there to have a good time. And he says, you know, we're getting along pretty good. Let's, let's fast and pray about whether or not we should get married. And I'm thinking, wow, what a great idea. I can get rid of him <laughs> and keep going. She, she left out part of it. Let me, oh. Before that, before that, I, I suggested this uh, get an engagement thing. And, and she says, uh, we can't do that. I said, why not? Well, this, this, and so we made a list. And I had answers for everything on the list, why we could instead of couldn't. Well, yes, and, yeah, at first, at first she says, you know, we, we should. And I said, no, we can't. And he gave all these reasons why we can't. And then after a while, then it's, well, you know, maybe we could. And, <laughs> and then, then the, the fasting and prayer part came up. Oh, yes. And she thought she could get out of it that way. Oh, yes. Uh, and you know what? I learned a very important lesson. Fasting and prayer is real. You don't mess around with it. It is real. And if you want an answer, you fast and pray. If you really don't want an answer, don't bother because you will get an answer. We both did, and we both got a dramatic answer. And it was scary. I mean, we had known each other maybe five or six weeks, and then all of a sudden, we know that we are supposed to get married, have an eternal family, the whole nine yards. And we're kind of staring at each other thinking, but, you know, we don't even really love each other yet. <laughs> and and it was really kind of scary. I had to keep going back and praying. And the Lord kept saying, yes, yes, it's okay, it's okay. That's what I want you to do. Are you sure? Yes, yes. And, and it's just one of those things. I learned it's real. Now, and to have denied my answer would be like denying the church is true. Now, I got the same answer. 
But he didn't have to keep going and praying. And I thought, you know, she has a swimming class. I think I'll go up and see what she really looks, looks like. like. <laughs> well, BYU swimsuits don't have any extras to <laughs> give you any form, you know. And I went up there and I watched. I found her and looked. I ran back home and prayed again. <laughs> Hi, Lord, are you sure about this? <laughs> Bang, I got another answer. Yes, oh, okay. <laughs> But I wasn't disappointed. It was just those lousy BYU swimsuits. Well, and then there was a day uh, that we actually got pinned and um, engaged to become engaged. We kind of set it up that if by the end of the year, when school ends, this is like March, if if we will either get unengaged or engaged. But of course, the next week we set a wedding date. We weren't engaged, but we had a wedding date. <laughs> <laughs> You know, it's just this really scary time, and you find yourself doing things like setting a wedding date without even hardly realizing it. And uh, the wedding date wasn't going to be until August 10th. Then we found out that was like a Thursday. We thought Saturday was better, August 12th. But this is March, so you choose August because it's so far away, it will never come. <laughs> and And that's reassuring when now, you're in that kind of a situation. Our ward was attending these old buildings off campus there, those big stately old buildings, some that burnt down in Provo. And uh, they were they were humongous things. And I remember one day uh, while we were dating and I looked down there and there's Sylvia way down there coming up. I was wearing a white sweater with, and a red skirt. With everybody else and she just glowed, you know. She, she says that was an aura around you. I think that's when I took her down to the steps there and proposed that we get pinned. Yeah. And I, I told her, I'll never ask twice. Oh. Because if you don't know, then I don't want to marry you. You know, we both have to know. And she was... Dating this other she guy. She was dating this <laughs> creep. And she says, I got to... I, I, I'm not saying no, but I got to let this other guy know first. That's it's only right. Only I said, right. well, I'll let you do that. You meet me this afternoon behind the house, behind but our apartment. But when he saw me down the other end of the building and this aura around me, he says, I just heard a voice. It just said, that's the one. That's the one, Mary. The guy she was dating was a Oh, real... don't even want to discuss it. <laughs> He's the kind of wipes his nose on his sleeve. He was rough. He'd put his hand through a, a window if he was mad, and we'd play basketball. And uh, you know, I didn't know if he was going to come after me and, and beat me to a pulp after this. But uh, he went his own way. Well, I'll tell I pity you, the gal he ever married. Yeah, we were we were dating, and it was getting serious. But I was kind of you know vacillating there, and uh, and I decided that's him. That's the one I want. Give him to me. And you know Ooh, what? Me or the other no, guy? No, the other guy. <laughs> and yeah, he did. He got really serious and he wanted to get more serious and not date anybody else and all of this kind of stuff. And that was an interesting experience too because that whole week was, I could still remember, was one of the most miserable weeks of my whole life. When they talk about how you could have a stupor of thought, my whole brain, it just, there was no spiritual communication, no anything. It was just wrong. And that was, I guess, the Lord's way of telling me it is just wrong. I was just miserable in that stupor of thought all week. And then that Sunday is the Sunday that we got pinned. And, and everything was right again. And I mean, I still was, oh, are you really going to make me go through with this? But it was, it was different. It was comforting, and I felt the Lord's Spirit guiding us, and, and we didn't know each other all that long, but uh, it worked out. I'll tell you, the, the first year of marriage, I was so stupid, and I made so many dumb, so, did so many dumb things that I was, I'm really grateful to have had a wife who who would look past that and who, and... who learned not to cry on Valentine's Day. <laughs> yeah. Well, that wasn't my fault. But... Yes, it was. You didn't even say Happy Valentine's Day. Well, if I'd seen the Valentine's car, that I would have said, oh, I would have gone out and done something. But 
You would have gone to 7-Eleven and picked up something. Something. That was left over. And Get you a bowling ball with his name engraved on it. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, no, it's... Those... That... Your first year of marriage can be very... Challenging. Challenging. And, and you've got to adjust, make these horrible big adjustments to each other. I will say... It, you're so, it's such an emotional time, and uh, I just remember, I think I cried more the first year we were married than I've ever cried in my whole life. Just because it was a way to release emotions. And I'm sitting there going, oh, I do <laughs> but I didn't help it any, I don't think. But it's, uh, the, it was a marriage that uh, was meant to be. Here it is 45 years later, I think that's proof. And uh, I've, I've looked at other men both in and out of the church and things that have happened to their lives and their marriages and uh, we're blessed. We've had challenges but they, they never seemed unsurmountable. They've never We've had a lot of economic challenges being in business for yourself all those years. We had highs and lows, highs and real lows. And I know men that have gone through that. When they hit the low, the wife just says, that's it. You're not supporting me. I'm out of here, you know. And yet, when I would come home on those worst of times and lay my head on Sylvia's lap and just cry, she would say, I don't care. I don't care. We can live in a tent. As long as we're together, we can live in a tent. Whatever problems we've had, we were always on the same side of the fence. And that is such a, a help, such a, a blessing. I just can't, you know, tell you how much it means. We've never really had any arguments over money except that we spend it and never budget it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I... It's my goal to earn more than she can spend, but she's better at it than me, so <laughs> that's just one of those things, you know. But uh, those early days were great, because we were poor and we depended on each other. Oh, gee. His parents lived a thousand miles there, my parents lived a thousand miles there, and if we had any problems, we had to solve them between us. Couldn't, we couldn't go home to Mama. Couldn't go home to Mama. And, or dad or whatever and um, that helps yeah it really did it we had to and if he if I got my feelings hurt he's the one who hurt them if I got my feelings hurt I had to go to him to get comfort that was a real challenge to accept that and Sylvia was the oldest of the three children of a of a, a single parent family mother so that was pretty rare in those days, wasn't it? Uh, yeah, and I learned how to be really bossy. She was. I mean, she the oldest child. She was used to taking control and running things. Her mother you was kind of... don't say. <laughs> you didn't know that, huh? <laughs> and uh, in a way, her mother was kind of milk toast. The other way, she was as strong as they come. But she would let Sylvia run so much as she got older. So I had to well, sit plus down. Plus, I had that kind of personality. <laughs> I had to sit, not anymore, though. sit down with Sylvia and say, look, it uh, may not be right, but it's the way it is. I hold the priesthood and you don't. So this marriage is 4951. And I have the deciding vote because I have the priesthood. It has to be that way. But we've never had a problem. It's never come down to a vote so much as find a way to make we'll things work, agree. Work, happen. work together. Work together, work it out, whatever. Yeah. Uh, you know, I think my dream I had today spawned a lot of memories, <laughs> you know? So, going back to when you were uh, dating, um, did you have like some, some more stories to tell about uh, how awkward it was you didn't know each other? Oh. Coming, coming back from your parents and right before the wedding? 
Well, I told the wrong name. <laughs> I had told mom that I was marrying some gal named Phyllis because I could never remember Sylvia's name. Oh, when I called my mother and said that I was engaged, getting married, and he says, well, which one did you decide, the clod or the creep? <laughs> I said, oh, I married the creep. <laughs> Her mother loved me, though. Her mother loved me more oh, than she loved Oh, yes, her. not, but after she met him. But at first she was pretty upset that he came along, but she liked him. But, uh, yeah. And then, uh, and we never really had money problems when we were dating. Whoever had some money took the other one out. It didn't matter if it was my dollar or his dollar. And even after we were married, you for a nickel you could get a nice treat at the bakery at there at BYU, and he's the one who always carried the nickel. <laughs> and for 25 cents we could see a movie, Von Ryan's Express. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know how long that played over there at BYU. We yeah, saw, we that saw that a few times. a lot of times yeah. for, you go for a quarter. Yeah, so we had some place to go. Yeah. And, and whatever, it was just the time that we spent together. But, okay, so in May, at the end of the school year, David flew back to Missouri with me, met my family. My mother decided it was okay. She liked him. He flew home. I stayed in Missouri to make my wedding dress and prepare for our, the wedding. Three weeks before we were married, was it, I... This is like in the summer? This summer, mm -hmm. And I went home and drove myself silly trying to earn money for... And he didn't get, get a job till after we got married. No, I so, did. Well, at the very end, the last couple of weeks, you got a job. But anyway, so I flew out there about three weeks before we got married. And even though we had letters, and he had sent me a letter on a little tape recorder, um, we'd been... We'd only known each other six months, and the last third of the time that we knew each other, we weren't together. And I wasn't even sure I could remember what he looked like. And I Same got here. off the plane and I looked around and I, oh, yeah, that's him. <laughs> I got off the plane and he's standing there to greet me and... With my little brother. Yeah, this is what this we did. Hi. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <laughs> I wasn't, well, neither was going to kiss, good heavens. <laughs> so... Somehow we got rid of the little brother. And well, he stayed with the luggage while we walked back to get the car. Oh, yeah. Then we smooched it up and got <laughs> luster. Yeah. yeah. Then we got acquainted real fast. <laughs> but that first thing off of the airplane was... <laughs> <laughs> Shaking the head, you know. Yeah. Oh. But then we, are, we were there three weeks, and Dave's mom... And we just witnessed the second time in your marriage you've ever shaken hands. Probably yeah. so. <laughs> you want to see the kissing part? <laughs> oh, that's, a, okay. that's the third time. That's a kissing. So anyway, uh, and Dave's parents put on a nice uh, little open house for us after the day we were married and mother, mom made a food for people who were coming and everything afterwards. And they made this neat floating candle oh, thing. Oh, that was Sherry. And it... It was so hot, all the candles melted. <laughs> it was on a pool, and the candles just laid out like that. And uh, my stepmother, Anne, made a nice cake for us and uh, had little purple grapes and things on it. It was real pretty. She decorated cakes. And we served it, and probably peanuts, because we were on a budget, <laughs> nuts and mints. And your mother had taken me to uh, a flower mart in bought me flowers and uh, things so that I made my own bouquet and for my sister, she was my bridesmaid. And Candy got to walk around and carry, she was a little girl who's like five or six, she got to carry my um, train that I had attached to my dress. And it was the hottest day of the year and all I was waiting, oh please throw the bride in the pool, please throw the bride in the pool. <laughs> I had a long sleeve shirt and the first time I ever wore garments, I mean I had on more clothes than I was used to and nobody threw the bride in the pool. <laughs> and but when we left, we went to the motel that we had made a reservation at, turned to be the first motel down the road, and we left. I. I opened the drawer and I put our wedding certificate in the drawer and forgot about it when we left. They had called us the next day and we had to go back and pick it up. 
you know. I think it would have been important. But it, uh, the next morning we went to breakfast. You were still trying to get rid of them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we went to the IHOP for breakfast. It was back when the buildings were still. Warm. We were so concerned about finances because we weren't going to have any money. We had to save everything we had. Oh, well, we were concerned about looking mature and not being foolish and frivolous. We should have taken a honeymoon. We should have. To we figured the rest. we'd do it later. We should have at least gone to San Francisco and checked into a fancy hotel. You know, but... Well, with the $200 that you earned and his dad and mom giving us each a $100 bill, that's a $400 that bought us a car. It was the uh, little Austin. The MG 1100? Yeah, the MG 1100. Did we buy it in California? Or yes, there? we did. That's how we got back to the line. Oh. And you bought, you spent, I think, $50 and you bought a trailer that was made out of a pickup truck bed. And we had that washer in it. Linda gave us her old washing machine. And, uh, no, you you got some timing wrong because we wouldn't have pulled a trailer with that MG. I guess not. Well, it barely got over that mountain by itself. I think I can. I think I can. I think I can. <laughs> that was uh, just about it. I think I can. I think I can. We've got five minutes of tape left. That that MG eleven hundred had a transverse engine front wheel drive. Very unusual in those days. No one had one like that. And. It was always overheating because it had a radiator in, in a wheel well, that's all, you know. And uh, so I went down to the junkyard, got a heater core out of a Lincoln, and put it in the other wheel well and ran the heater hoses to it. So I turned on the heater and helped cool it down, you know. Got it, made it, made it go. And we eventually sold that. We sold it to B.H. Roberts. Yes. He came into our little apartment and looked at our little bookcase with our few little books in it, and there was the one he had written on the, the doctor's... The LDS Encyclopedia or something? Something, I don't know. We probably still we have still it We still have somewhere. it. Yeah, we have it over there. And uh, he looked at us. I wrote that book. <laughs> oh, he signed it for us, and he did. Yeah. So, no, we We've were... We've been through a lot of cars in our marriage. Yeah. We, uh, at one point, we, we bought this Oldsmobile back in California and trying to come across it was da 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 da. Had a, one of the wheels were bad. We finally switched it around and got home. Ended up selling that to a guy. And I bought this old pickup. Purple pickup? Purple pickup. Well, that was when we were in Salt Lake. But I uh, was thinking of the time that we. We were coming across, and David was uh, sleepy, and he had me to drive while we were going over the mountains. And he says, "Wake me up if you have any hear if any funny noises." And guess what? The smoke was just pouring out of the back of the car. It was a 1955 Ford. Three it minutes. was pristine, but the transmission had a leak. And the smoke was pouring out. And I was asleep. And there was a couple, an older couple who could see that the husband was asleep and the wife was up And there was a BYU sticker on there, and they were LDS, he was a bishop. Yeah, and they made us pull over. <laughs> Why didn't you tell me? She said, well, there were none of the lights came on, didn't make any noise. <laughs> so we, we got down to their place. Uh, see, as long as I kept enough uh, junk in there to keep the seals, it would work. We drove it out. You know, we're trying to drive well, back. Well, David's parents brought us another car. Yeah, I had a motor in the back to go into this Hillman that her Uncle, Uncle Dennis had blown the motor on price, and we towed it in. And then he left it to us. So I found one in a junkyard where in California and bring it back in the trunk of this car. And uh, doggone, the, uh, it was a nice car if... We should have overhauled, stayed there and had them overhauled the transmission. It would cost money, but we would have had a nice car for a long time. But David's parents towed up another car and then towed that one back. A real old oh. 1951 Ford 
and the, the, all the linings were hanging in shreds on the doors and the ceilings. When we got to the gas station, we, we looked around to make sure nobody was looking before we opened the doors. It looked so bad inside. We looked like a couple of hippies. And the we hippie trans movement was big then. We transferred that motor into that one, and that made that old one sink because it was all the springs were worn out on it. Uh, but it got us back to Provo. Yeah, and I traded it to a guy who had an auto body shop for putting the motor in the Hillman for me. And uh, then we had that Hillman for a while. I don't know what. One minute left, so. Well, let's oh, well, we, we had a, Oh, we had a, yeah, a date car um, that was very interesting. Morris Minor. Yeah, but, and we found it years later. We found it in a junkyard. It was, yeah. <laughs> Still there. <laughs> Might not, probably not there now, but it was at the time. Okay, there's a lot of other stuff, but that's it. I'll get us, get us started, huh? <laughs> And I think it just makes sense every time we're talking about old stories, pull the camera out. Yeah, I guess well, you're then right you better that. transfer one of those things yeah. so that we have a full one. Because there's a lot more to tell. Oh, I, we're not going to tell all of that. Barely my, end of the remarriage. My army life. Oh. Why would you want to leave that for posterity? Well, you know, that was Shows me. the kind of character he is. That's right. Yeah. You're a character, all right.